Welcome back to Psychology Applied to Work. This is Lecture 38, Engineering Psychology. All right, we left off with Lecture 37 and talking about stress moderators. Um, so we talked about the moderators of stress and strain. And we talked about recovery and the importance of sleep. We talked about work-life imbalances. We talked about burnout and interventions. And today we are going to start chapter 14, Engineering Psychology. So we'll introduce what that is. And we'll talk about efficiency of time, tools, and movement. Talk about the person-machine system, what that means. And you know, that's, that's a thing that's basically everywhere. If a person's uh, the operator, uh, or the monitoring um, of a role. It, there's a person-machine person system in place. And then we'll talk about displays and controls. And then uh, finish it up talking about human factors, which is another name for engineering psychology, um, and how it applies to different, f different uh, fields. Okay, what is this engineering psychology? It's important to remember that humans, uh, we build our own environment. Um, so you can think of it as humans live in built environments. So, um, you know, maybe um, thousands of years ago, the, the, the average human was maybe living in, in caves or lean-tos. You're probably going many, many thousands of years ago before we had our, for, before the majority of humans were living in built environments. And in fact, it's debatable, you know, whether uh, built environments was actually something that would go back to um, pre-homo pre sapiens. Um, you know, certainly uh, tool use is, uh, was uh, ubiquitous among the hominids. Um, and if you're making tools uh, and you're making advanced tools that require multiple steps um, and you're making, uh, you know, animal, just putting animal skins on for clothes is itself changing the nature of your environment. That's, that's built environment means more than just, um, you know, have you built a shelter or not. But in today's, you know, modern world, almost everything you look at is built. Um, I'm sitting here uh, inside my office and I'm looking around um, and uh, there's not a whole lot of, uh, um, there's pretty much nothing um, that I can see because um, I can't see out my windows right now. Um, pretty much nothing I can see that wasn't basically the creation of humans and human machine combinations. And uh, that's pretty normal. So um, when you think about everything we do and everything we're interacting with, um, there's ways of trying to make that, um, the use of that as a tool or our enjoyment of it or our interaction with it um, is as uh, optimal as possible. Um, that's where engineering psychology um, uh, plays into it. All right, so uh, engineering psychology has also been called human factors or human engineering. You might even hear human factors engineering. Um, a, 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 an older term is ergonomics. Um, and basically what it is, is you're applying scientific methods um, to these built environments. You're looking at um, the um, all aspects of our built environment that engineering psychology is brought to bear on. Um, so that could be anything from a tool to uh, an office. Um, and you're looking at applying IO psychology, um, scientific rigor to that. And so you're looking at optimizing that environment for humans. Now it's a hybrid discipline. So engineering psychology is certainly um, a part of industrial and organizational psychology, but it's also a branch of engineering. Um, it's also uh, um, involves a lot of uh, medicine. Um, it actually involves anthropology. When you think about um, uh, our lineage and you think about uh, all of the built environments um, that, uh, you know, had, have evolved culturally and biologically, um, or at least were influenced by, by both. Um, uh, when you think about the evolution of, you know, a particular uh, hunter-gatherer shelter, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of trial and error. There was a lot of selection going on. Um, and so what you ended up with is something that was often, um, you know, it, it, in its, its own kind of optimization uh, emerged out of it. So, um, there's a lot of anthropology that's involved in this and certainly sociology as well. So it's a hybrid discipline that should make sense to you. Um, there's a lot of cross-domain um, elements to 
uh, how humans and machines and the environment uh, are entangled and how uh, humans are shaped by their environment, but yet they built their environment and, and, and all of that uh, interesting reciprocality at play. Um, another way of looking at this, uh, we talked about niche finding, um, yeah, certainly uh, in a number of the bonus lectures, and I've mentioned it uh, in some of the regular lectures too, you know, that humans basically are looking for finding uh, uh, niches that uh, suit them, and certainly part of uh, you know job selection and certainly career development is all about you know trying to um, improve what you know and what what skills you have, you know your own KSAOs, um, and try to line that up with what an organization needs, and try to find yourself a niche that uh, is hopefully um, a well-paying niche, a fulfilling niche, um, hopefully a stable niche. That, that can last a long time. Um, so what, a way to think of engineering psychology is, is we're also building the niche. You know, we're also building the machines that we're going to interact with. We're also building the office environs that we're going to, that we're going to be working in. We're building the houses, we're building the furniture. All of this is part of the built environment and it actually creates the environment we live in. And so it, it is creating our own um, niches. Uh, there's so much combinatorial complexity to it that there's plenty of niche finding to go around anywhere. Um, but the, the, the niches we find are, are again, part of the built environment. So um, the, the, this complex web of people built the niche that you found. Um, anyway, uh, it's just an interesting way of looking at it. Okay, um, so um, you can think of organizational psychology, or at least parts of, org remember, industrial and organizational psychology. Um, you can think of the organizational side uh, as sort of applying science to look at how uh, humans can best fit into the organizational workplace, you know, and things like, um, you know, what is the best leadership? Um, you know, what are ways to maximize motivation? Uh, you know, what are ways to maximize engagement? What are ways to improve job performance? Um, and, and you can kind of look at that as, as how do you get a human to, to best find their, their niche or adapt to the niche that you have? You know, if you have an organization, you have a job to do, you know, here's a niche. Um, you know, how do you get people to not just accept that, but, but, but hopefully like excel in it? Um, and you can think of engineering psychology, uh, it's not necessarily the other side of that coin, but, 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 but something that's, that's a, little, a little different than how well the human fits. Um, and that's where there's more optionality to it, which is, okay, how can we help, um, how can we change the environment itself, the built environment, you know, the tool, uh, you know, the, the, the process, um, you know, the, the nature of the workplace so that it fits the human. Um, and it's both ways. So engineering psychology is really about optimizing that person environment, person machine fit. Um, you know, there's limits to how much you can change a person, right? Can't, you know, you shouldn't go around trying to make them shorter or taller, um, you know, unless they're just growing, growing naturally. Um, and, uh, you know, you have to deal with our senses, our level of strength, our reaction times, our, co our cognitive abilities and that sort of thing. Um, so most of the uh, um, activity of engineering psychology involves changing the thing, you know, changing the, 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 uh, the gun sight on the bomber, uh, you know, changing the, the nature of the keyboard, changing... Um, and the way you've designed the, the, the suitcase or the, or the, or the um, um, couch, you know, to fit the human and to fit the, the different types of humans. And, but, but then when you actually like create something like say a software interface, you end up changing the, the, the person themselves. I mean, we're, you, we have digital natives now, people that are now adults who basically have known, um, computers their whole life and have known interacting with screens their whole life. And that's actually wired their brains. So, I mean, the, there is a certain amount, uh, perhaps a lot, of, um, of uh, human change that's at play here, uh, along with uh, our built environment change. So, interesting things to think about. Um, okay, so a little practical studies, uh, in, in practical stuff in engineering psychology, a lot of time and motion studies, a lot of uh, things trying to figure out um, how to, um, you know, have the worker and the machine, you know, best uh, um, optimally balanced for, for what the worker brings and what the machine brings and what kind of optionality you have in both the type of worker, the training available to the worker, um, their strength and abilities and knowledge and all that, as well as all the optionality you might have in configuring a machine. So remember, um, in the history 
of IO Psychology, Lecture 2. You know, we talked about how World War II was really the birth um, of this, at least this conceptualization that, hey, you know, we should take into account psychology when we're engineering. Um, certainly when we're engineering something that is a person is interacting with. You know, and in, in the, um, you know, uh, high stakes environment of World War II, uh, you had a, con you had, well, you, you, we were at war, people were dying and we wanted to win. Um, and at the same time, um, we were uh, ev rapidly evolving our war machinery. And at the same time, um, industrial revolution was sort of peaking. And so we had all of this, um, um, new technology that was coming to, coming to, uh, um, um, coming to the surface or emerging uh, through through the efforts of, of uh, um, you know millions of uh, people trying to come up with the best new tools in order to, to in order to make the war a success um, and the recognition that people interacting with these tools were a, were a big part of it and that we ought to adapt the tool adapt the technique um, so that it works best with the way humans naturally are. So coming out with ways that would make firearms more um, ergonomic, which is to say, you know, better form, the form factor better fit to the, the typical statured person. Um, uh, to how, to, how to make interactions on complex things uh, more intuitive, um, you know, how to make the steps something that, that's more trainable. Um, you know, how do you get something that you can, how can you get an aircraft um, that might have a lot of complexity, a lot of controls, a lot of a lot of gauges. How can you simplify it to its essence so that somebody with a minimal amount of training, um, you know, can fly that in a war and 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 you know, presumably fulfill their mission and hopefully not die. Um, so a lot of energy went into that, and that was really the birth of engineering psychology. And then uh, um, after World War II. Um, there was a tremendous amount of spillover in what was learned during World War II uh, in applying engineering psychology to everyday life, to products and, and the environment um, post-war. So you had modern kitchens and automobiles, electronics, and all sorts of things. All right, so um, a big part of, of engineering psychology involves efficiency, uh, and that includes efficiency of time, um, efficiency of tools, uh, it often involves a study of movement, um, yeah, um, all, all of it uh, geared towards typically efficiency or safety. And efficiency can mean lots of things. Efficiency can mean how do, how do you make the most, most efficient way to make the best product the fastest or the cheapest to the highest quality, those sorts of things. And recall um, Taylorism, scientific management. Re re recall the, the sort of the early years of uh, IO psychology. Um, and, uh, and, and that wasn't, you know, technically refer, we don't generally refer to that as, we don't generally refer to that as engineering psychology, but you can kind of see its birth a, a little bit in the, this applying science to the way we do stuff in the workplace, um, in, in Taylorism and, and, uh, the Gilbreths and, and, uh, um, general efficiency, uh, um, uh, researchers, you know, looked at motions and trying to figure out what the was the most efficient. Recall Lillian and, and, and her husband Frank Gilbreth did a lot of time in motion studies. Today we have modern um, modern day efficiency experts in all sorts of areas. Um, you have things called lean process methodologies, which is trying to figure out how to do something with the you know the least amount of steps and still have it be appropriate and high quality and those sorts of things. Um, those include include things like minimum reach to tools, uh, symmetric movements with both hands, try to keep your hands in, in, in near constant movement, use the full, bo full body to operate machines, um, you know, minimize the times that humans are carrying things and holding things. And we'll talk about that a little bit and, and optimizing height and that sort of thing. We'll revisit this in just a, just a little bit. Um, okay, person machine systems. Everything, <laughs> well, not everything, um, but if you're interacting with, you know, something that was built um, and, and, and you are, you know, doing more than staring at it. Okay. If you're staring at a piece of art, um, that you're not, <laughs> we wouldn't say that's a person machine system, but I mean, if you're, if you're, uh, working with something that has some level of optionality, some level of configurability to it, it does some function and, in in order for it to function, you have to do something well, that's a person machine fit. Uh, system, you know, uh, if you're reading these words on a screen, you're a person machine uh, machine system. You're part of that. Um, I guess um, if you printed this, 
if you printed the slides and you're not hearing my words, you're just seeing what, what's, what's written down, um, you know, you're, you're observing information and you wouldn't call the pieces of paper and you a person machine system. But if you're actually looking at this on a screen, the amount of complexity uh, <laughs> involved in, in um, creating the pixels and the lighting uh, um, in the in the in the contrast in the color uh, for you to actually read these slides uh, is unbelievable. I mean, it, it, it is uh, the culmination of thousands of years of uh, of human cultural evolution and technological evolution to get to where you can stare at a screen and see those words. Um, and it's absolutely a machine. It's an it, and it isn't just um, you know the uh, the display subassembly and um, and uh, um, uh, chips that, uh, that drive it. Um, there's an insane amount of software that's running on that. That's also the product of, uh, of um, probably thousands of, of, of people, depending upon what you're, how, what you're viewing this on. So um, certainly stare, anytime you're staring at a screen, which um, for most of us, uh, uh, for better or for worse, is many hours a day. You know, we are constantly person machine systems. You know, when we're driving car, uh, dri driving our cars, we're person machine systems. When we're using the microwave, we're person machine systems. Um, so you've got an operator. That's the that's the human, and you've got a machine of some kind, and and you're doing something together uh, in order to perform a task. That's a person machine system. The human in a in a person machine system can be active, can be the one calling all the shots, or it could be something where you're essentially, uh, uh, essentially the monitor. You know, you're there to like get it started, uh, and make sure things don't go astray, and wait for the output. I mean, you're if you're if 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 you're still if you still have a role like to get it going, if you're the input and the output for the whole thing, you're you're still a person machine system. And when you look at engineering psychology, uh, you know, and and the person machine system, and engineers are de de are designing the machine. You know, a factory uh, is typically building the machine. Uh, the person is the operator to the machine. But engineering psychology is looking at how do we design the machine? How do we create the training program um, so that that person machine interaction is is really optimal. And, and what do we mean optimal? Um, so you think of it as an allocation of the labor or, or you know, the, the task. How much of the function is going to be the human and how much of the function is going to be the machine? Some of that's technological and certainly the history of person-machine interaction. Um, uh, how many things we could allocate, allocate to the machine um, was, was very much limited by technology. Um, but there are plenty of, of, of times where it's not so limited to technology now, but it might be limited to cost and space and, and other things or in just what the, the human wants to do. Um, and safety and efficiency are the big things here. Um, there are things that we uh, generally relegate to machines because it would be very unsafe for us to do them. They're at too high of a temperature. They're involving too much kinetic energy. You know, they're dealing with, with um, um, you know, chemicals that, uh, that aren't good for us to breathe or touch or, 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 or uh, uh, maybe they uh, give us cancer, those sorts of things. There's all sorts of, of things that we allocate to the machine for the, sa for the sake of safety. And for everything else, it's, you know, some form of efficiency, which I mean is just a catch-all for like to do things, you know, better or to, to do things optimally. And what do we mean by that uh, optimally really depends on what dimensions you're talking about. I mean, it could be cost, it could be quality, it could be... There could be an aesthetic element to it. It could be time-based. You know, there's all there could be just space constraints. I mean, what are the values at play? You know, what's the context? So, what do we mean by efficiency? Is it just really situationally dependent? Um, anyway, I've, the function allocation is the big thing to think about here uh, when you're looking at engineering psychology and what it's looking at for person-machine systems. Function allocation with with the view of safety and efficiency. So automation, you've heard that term many times. Um, that's really when when you're taking a function that previously had been a, a human function and due to clever engineering or new technology or, or just a combination of all sorts of stuff, you can now move that function from the, from the human to the machine, uh, regardless of whether you did that for safety or, or, or what dimension of efficiency you were doing that for, that step is, an, is a step of automation. 
you know, so you're so you're now changing what the the allocation of the of the labor, so to speak, from human towards machine is a is a step of automation, and automation can obviously be driven by safety or efficiency. Um, cost is usually a big factor here too, um, and, and you can look at the sort of the history of technology and large. Sw I mean, sometimes technology isn't so much automation; it's all in the sense that um, technology sometimes enables things humans can't do. You know. Uh, if you think about, uh, I don't know, a, ca a medieval catapult, um, you know, humans were never able to, with our own strength, you know, throw some of the things th that a catapult can. Um, so um, the automation, I guess, would have been to go from, um, you know, a, a, a spear to, to a bow and arrow or a crossbow, but, but then getting bigger and bigger and bigger until you had the, 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 these medieval war machines able to to throw uh, uh, objects uh, incredibly, you know, heavy and uh, incredibly far distances, you start getting to where you're enabling new function. So would you really call that automation? No, um, but it, it, there was automation along the way. So savings of work um, and then the scaling up of that work um, is all part of what technology is doing. Uh, and if there's a human operator, it's all part of uh, human machine uh, systems. Um, okay, full automation, you know, in th and again, what do we you know, really mean by that? Are you there to turn it on? Are you monitoring? I mean, the devil's in the details here, but generally speaking, when, if you eliminate all of the steps that the human was doing, that's generally autonomy, you know, and this is a relatively new, it's not a new term, but, you know, but it's new in our, in our regular vernacular, um, because, uh, you know, autonomous robots, autonomous drones, autonomous cars, um, are, are new phenomenon. I mean, people, people are talking about, talking about robots to, you know, when are robots going to do the dishes for us? I mean, that's obviously been, you know, a, automata um, is an old, relatively old term, uh, probably more than a, uh, uh, well, more than a century old. Um, but autonomy, that's really, a, in terms of near term, um, it's, a, it's a relatively new term enabled by um, uh, at least as it relates to uh, uh, m machines, um, it's a term enabled by the perception technology that, like machine learning, has uh, um, um, has made possible uh, only in the past uh, decade or so. Very exciting time, scary time, uh, depending how you look at it. Um, okay, so um, it, it, another thing to, to to point out in terms of that whole safety or efficiency. Efficiency could just be you know, you're, you're taking, you know, tedious work away from people, you know, the, the, uh, and at the end of the day, if you, ha if, if, if you can't get something fully autonomous, um, it's automated, but there's still some oversight needed that's staring at the thing going that, uh, the factory line going by and you're just there in case something screws up. I mean, that can be, that can be, uh, its own form of strain, right? Tedium. We talked about that in previous lectures. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about, uh, person machine systems uh, and then how it relates to the design of the workplace, the design of things like tools. And we're just going to get a little bit more detail into some stuff that we've already talked about. So remember Taylor, Ta uh, Frederick W. Taylor and Taylorism, you know, it's really the, f he's the first person to at least get credit for that sole scientific approach of looking at how a, a task is done. And, um, and this would have been the early part of the 20th century. There was still a lot of coal shoveling going on, um, uh, there were a lot of uh, um, coal-fired coal systems. Uh, there were a lot of steam-powered systems. There were a lot of uh, um, uh, boilers that were then used to make electricity or they were used to r uh, run hot steam in, uh, into factories and then um, you know, do, turn that steam into work or, or, or use that for process heat or, or, or whatever. And so you would employ lots of people, almost always men, Basically, what their job was just to sh shovel coal. Um, and um, one of the famous things with Taylorism um, was studying this scientifically. And, f and his big famous, and to, to, make, <laughs> to make a big study um, that was very influential, you know, n you know, narrowed down to like a cartoon line, you know, he determined that 21.5 pounds was optimal. Now, t now, today we would understand that to mean, you know, across the average of of uh, you know men who were shoveling coal in the study, um, 
that was determined in, in the way they were shoveling it, it was determined that was the most efficient. So if they had less than that, you know, they wouldn't fatigue, they'd last longer. But again, you know, if it's 10 pounds, I mean, it would, you'd, it's more than twice the amount of shoveling needed to get the same amount. But if it was 40 pounds, I mean, they'd be very quickly, you know, hurt your back or your, or your biceps or, or, or your shoulder or whatever. So it was found that that 21.5 pounds was like the ideal trade space uh, between um, too much and it would fatigue and too little and you just wouldn't be productive. Now that depends on lots of things. I mean, they were also studying like the, the, all of the techniques by which one sh does the, the optimal shovel. Uh, you know, and, and today we would look at this as, um, you, you know, t probably ca um, calibrated uh, or, 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 or tailored to the um, stature and strength and endurance of the individual worker. You know, and you might do like an assessment of the worker uh, um, and determine that this worker is best with 18 pounds and this other worker is just built like an ox, you know, you know can go 28 pounds. I don't know. Um, the, we, don't, we don't employ a lot of people shoveling coal all day anymore. Um, but the, the impor important point here is, is uh, um, you know, Taylorism started quantifying these things and applying a scientific approach to it. And then remember the Gilbreths, you know, uh, Lillian Gilbreth was the one that um, was the most impactful because she, she, but it was her and her husband, Frank, that started this um, work sort of continuing on Taylorism work, applying it to time and motion studies. Um, you know, uh, you know, Frank died and, and, and Lillian lived for many more decades and, and, and was very influential. Um, uh, throughout uh, the, you know the post-war years, uh, uh, well, um, pre and post. Uh, anyway, the you know the the trying the kitchen triangle and a whole bunch of other stuff are credited to her. Um, and uh, one of the earliest things they did was you know looking at time in motion study, the optimal amount of what's your most economical motion that saves you the you know that, that allows you to do the task at least amount of time. And like bricklaying was one of the big things that they did. And one of the big things here was eliminate unnecessary motion. So it's that, and that's a lean principle. Lean lean is a more modern term. Um, came out of uh, um, some manufacturing stuff that was. Uh, pioneer, pioneered in Japan, but really it's just, you know, get rid of things that you don't actually need to do, in this case, unnecessary motion. Uh, and then there's this term, human uh, uh, anthropometry. It's, I don't know, it's anthropometry. Uh, maybe maybe Google it, find it, watch a YouTube video. Maybe there's a better way of saying it out loud, but it's kind of a, uh, a, a painful thing to pronounce. And that's where you're really looking at... Um, you t measuring the structures of the body. Okay, how long is the typical forearm? You know, what's the range of motion? You know, um, all the different degrees of freedom of, of, a, of a body. Uh, and then what's the task being performed? And how do you really optimize the workplace? Optimize the tools? Optimize the actual process that you're going through. You know, the laying of the bricks, the shoveling of the coal. You know, the typing on the keyboard, the, the assembly of the, you know, the widget that goes into the super widget. On the on the in the um, assembly cell at the factory, you know, looking at at uh, you know sort of carving a uh, um, well, that's a bad metaphor. Carving at the joints, it's an expression, but I'm basically looking at the f the, the full range of motion uh, and dimensionality of, of of a human body um, and incorporating that into workplace and tool and process design. Um, so you end up with workstation guidelines, and we talked about this a, a little bit so before. So we talked about, you know, the optimal, you know, the minimum reach to things. Uh, um, but um, you, you don't, if you have a lot of stuff that you're doing, if you're in a, a, a um, if you're part of an, an assembly cell and you're putting stuff together, uh, and let's say there's, um, I don't know, seven um, things that in your part of the assembly in the factory you're doing that you're grabbing, um, you want minimum reach, but you don't want them in just a giant pile in front of you. Um, and it was determined, for instance, that the, you know the optimum reach is about 28, um, 28 inches. So you know, and that would depend upon if if you're a real small stature or you're just a real real tall person, it might be a little bit different. But generally speaking, that you know that two foot range. Um, yeah, uh, or a little bit more than that is a good distance to quickly and efficiently because that way you're not like reaching um, but it's still it's kind of a, your tools or your stuff that you're pulling in are at a comfortable ergonomically comfortable um, perimeter to, to bring in um, to the focus on, on your work um, and then when you're done with your thing it will move on in the 
factory line, for instance. Um, and then symmetrical movements uh, are, are better. Um, you know, if you can come up and go like this, you know, that's generally better than, uh, than, than this. But whether that is applicable or not really depends on what exactly is it that you're doing in this workplace. Um, and then, uh, you know, hands aren't the only thing. So foot pedals. You know, the, there's all sorts of ways to turn something on and off. And so you think of sewing machines and foot pedals, you know. Um, you think about somebody playing an organ and foot pedals. Well, there's all sorts of f factory things that, that uh, um, your hands might be t turning various things. Um, but you might even operate something with your elbow. You might operate something with your knee. Um, you know, the, the, depending on what it is, that, uh, um, what step you're trying to do. Um, but hands and feet... Um, and you've got two of each, gives you a lot of optionality. Um, you know, generally speaking, avoiding idle hands. So um, if, uh, um, if you're looking for what the next step is uh, in, in a machine process, you know, maybe it's better to engage like the left hand to do something than it would be to then go to the feet. It really, it really depends on circumstances, but I mean, it's just sort of a general rule of thumb, keep people moving. Um, and then, uh, you know, you try to design the fixturing, try mounting, uh, um, um, the way things move around so that equipment is carrying the things and equipment is holding things still. And you as the human are, you know, doing work to the thing. You're assembling uh, the, 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 the widget in the factory, um, but you're not carrying it. I mean, typically speaking. So this is, this is uh, what I'm, what I'm, relaying here is uh, th these are just uh, some general guidelines that have come from a scientific study of uh, workplaces and tools. And height and position are obviously important too. Um, the height of a the working height of a desk or a standing desk, um, you know, the ergonomic positions of the body. A lot of this is to prevent repetitive motion. A lot of this is to have, you know, a good effective range of uh, range of motion. A lot of this is safety. Um, and again, um, you need some adjustability. Uh, to deal with, uh, you know, different height and, and other things uh, uh, due to the variability in, in humans. All right. Well, now we'll talk about another element. Um, so we were talking about person-machine um, combinations. Now let's talk about um, the, the uh, information flow, you know, and, uh, which is to say when the machine in, uh, is communicating to the human, when the machine is giving the human information. And then we'll do the opposite when the human is giving machine information. I'm using the term communication here, um, somewhat of a stretch if the, if the uh, machine itself isn't sentient, you know, but uh, um, if a machine is beeping, it's communicating to you. In that, in that regard, I mean, the, the expression communicating is an agentic term. It implies that the machine has agency, uh, but whatever, uh, work with me here. Um, so the, the most common, you know, the, perhaps the easiest thing to think about in terms of how does a machine communicate information is through displays uh, and predominantly through visual displays. And you can, you can look at visual di di displays um, it, 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 different um, different types of visual displays. So a quantitative visual display is typically something that's going to give you numerical values. Now that might be you know, a speedometer on your car that's a, that's analog, an old, uh, old style one with a needle, and um, uh, or it could be digital. It's just telling you you're going 37, now you're going 38. Um, it's quantitative, uh, whether that's displayed um, in uh, quantized jumps. Uh, or it's displayed in a continuum. If, if you can look at it and and read the communication as a numerical value, that's a quantitative uh, display. And then there's qualitative visual displays, and those are typically um, you know range uh, of information. Think of think of your gas gauge, where all you see is like you better go to the you better go to the gas station, and you're full, and you just have a sort of a, a balance up or down, and it's just a a visual proportional thing, um, and uh, and it's qualitative in nature, and you would have to, you know, make some some estimate, some inference to say that I think I've got about a quarter of a tank left. You're now adding that quantification because that information is not given in the in the uh, um, in what's viewable in the display. And then there's a kind of display just called check reading. 
that's real that's the simplest type of display and that's like on off you know light on light off or you know everything's normal or i've got an alert um and you know basically this is just like a a quick thing to tell you the state um of the machine um and it's not giving you any more information than that um and uh um you're not uh like sitting there and observing it and expecting um um you to get uh extra information so um on off normal abnormal um uh, and then uh things aren't always visual and i'm going to use this term displays expansively here because that's how the book does um you know one of my jobs is actually I'm responsible for human machine interface advanced engineering at a bit a giant company i've got uh, a team that works on these things we don't generally call um you know something that gives you communicates information to you auditorily we don't generally call that a display but you might have a display that has a speaker um, but we would call it like a, 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 a audible alert um, or whatever but um, we're going to stay with the book here we'll call that an auditory display and typically this is this is something that might be urgent um, or it's just giving you something um, that for whatever reason you don't need to don't want to or can't look at um, you uh, it, it might be just a reassuring tone uh, it might be a you know quite non-reassuring um, shrieky tone to alert you to something because um, the ears are always open and you can get in, you don't have to be you know you don't just listen to a spot the way you look to a spot you know if you're looking forward you don't see the stuff behind you but you hear stuff going all around um, you have a lot of covert attention going on to 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 sound, uh, and so sound is often um, used as a as as to help an operator to help the person orient to tell you, hey, something new. I'm going to give you a tone, you know, just like honking a horn and and alarm beeps and uh, and and those sorts of things. And then there's tactile displays, and again, this is an expansive use of the term display, but these is something that would be. Um, um uh like a vibration um you know something that you can that you can feel it's giving you some sort of information your phone does this when your phone vibrates um you don't find this in cars very often uh, and there's a physics element to that which is when you're uh when you're on your phone and you're doing something and and you did something that you know wasn't going to work or whatever and you felt a vibration or you got a vibration because you're getting a call um you know, t typically when you're holding it, the, all, the, the vi thing that's in there that's vibrating, um, you're experiencing all of that uh, little mass displacement in your hand. And so you feel that vibration. If it's instead, uh, you know, a display in a car, for instance, and you're like touching it, um, if it was vibrating, a lot, of, most of that vibration would actually go to the car. It's actually really difficult to get that vibration to go into just your finger. Um, but those are, that's called haptics. Yeah, just some some uh, nerding out there um, and uh, in the process here I uh, shut my PowerPoint down let me get it back for you this is one of those uh, times here we go and we're back okay um, haptics uh, uh, is uh, the term for uh, to, uh, when you're creating something that you can that you can feel as a dis on a, a display. Um, okay, so this, that was the um, machine to human communication, and now we're going to talk about the um, the human to the machine, uh, which is basically when you're doing something that you expect the machine to receive, and it's usually referred to as controls. Um, but it's an interesting conceptualization when you think of it as the human machine interface. HMI is actually a term used quite a bit in industry, and it means both all the bidirectionality involved between uh, what you're when you're in your car um, and you're turning the wheel and you're and you're um, um, on the on the gas pedal and touching buttons. You're communicating to the to the machine, the car, what you want it to do, uh, and then. When it's when it's giving you information, um, it's saying things on the on the instrument cluster. It's saying things on on the display. Um, you're hearing noises. Um, that's the machine communicating to you. So we talked about machine to human. Now we're going to talk human to machine. Um, and, and generally, can, that's 
what we would call controls. So uh, the guidelines for designing really good controls, and that, that involves what's called control body matching. Um, and that's basically what's the nature of the control and what's the appropriate body action that would be, that would be best used for that. And some of that might just be um, uh, specific to what, what's the best available body part uh, to do the action. Uh, but it's also like, what's the nature of that communication? So as an example, your hand, uh, your hands can do typically, typically, unless you work really hard at it uh, to train your brain, but the average person has much better fine motor control on their hands than they do their feet. And you would have to, have to you know, people who um, say are born without hands, or if you have an amputation, you start having to do stuff with your feet. You've probably seen the videos. People can do amazing things with their feet, you know, get themselves dressed, brush your teeth, all sorts of stuff. But tr I can't, you know, because my brain is not, my um, sensory motor cortex is not, has not dedicated that much of my, um, of my uh, um, neurons to the fine motor control of my feet. You know, I can kind of go like this with my feet, but with my hands, I can do a lot of fine motor stuff, and most likely so can you. So uh, that whole um, 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 control body matching for, uh, relates to, like, what is the nature of this, this control? And, and precision is a big part of that. And so you'd have precision would be something that would be slow movement. Um, and if it's just meant to be um, sort of gross movement, um, you use your feet. So you're not doing a whole lot on your gas pedal, you know. It's it's a rel it's generally a relative term, and the brake pedal's even even lower resolution, um, you know, a, a, as an as an example here. Um, and then um, there'd be your uh, you know your, there's there's things with your dominant hand and your and your non-dominant hand, so to speak. You know, most people are right-handed. Not everybody, you know. Typically, you know, you play a guitar uh, where you're doing things that that aren't quite as temporally demanding with your le with your um, left hand typically if you're right-handed and uh, um, and your right hand you if you're doing strumming you're going to do something that's a little bit more um, immediate you know at least if you're playing I don't know you're doing chords and you're strumming with the chords uh, um, that maybe that's a bad example because I've tried to play guitar and you do have a whole hell of a lot still going on with your non-dominant hand um, but anyway you get the idea control body matching um, and then uh, another thing, element to that is you don't want, um, you know, one part or your right hand is just constantly doing everything. You, you've got balance between there. Uh, there's, there's a, there's a trade-off depending on what you're trying to do. And, and that's why with a, with a car, um, you know, you have, you know, you have pedals on the floor and you have, uh, you have things for your hands up above, even though you could design it with everything up above and, and certain people that, that have, uh, um, um, certain types of disabilities can have custom cars designed that way, um, but it's you know can be taxing, um, and so having that um, that trade off between available body part and what's the appropriate body part based on control body matching. The other thing is what's called control task compatibility, and that's kind of where the action should mimic the movement, um, uh, at least to to be the most um, um, intuitive you know, think about like the steering the steering wheel of a car and if you think about the top part of the steering wheel um, if you're turning to the right you're kind of moving the top part over to the right and if you're turning to the left you're kind of moving to the left and yes if you look at the if you steer with the bottom it's the opposite but for the most part the the top part is kind of where your hands are if you're like 10 and 2 and it's 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 usually closer to where your eyesight is, and so you've got an intuitive mix, uh, an intuitive movement. Um, you can think of like uh, um, big levers that are also corresponding to large things moving back and forth. Uh, and so if you move a little bit, the, the, the machine moves a little, and if you move a lot, the machine moves a lot. So there's at least a kind of intuitive um, correlation between the type of movement and how the machine is moving. So that's control task compatibility. And then some practical stuff here. Um, if if you have a, a complex machine, you know, you think of uh, think of uh, agricultural equipment or 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 a sophisticated um, a piece of factory equipment or what have you. Um, you often will combine related types of controls so that when you're 
trying to do certain things or in certain places. I mean, it's, this is kind of practical. It's kind of what would be the most intuitive, what's the, the easiest to train, or, you know, what's the hardest to screw up because a lot of time these things are, are uh, you have a lot of safety uh, um, elements to this. Anytime you have a big piece of equipment, you, you often have a lot of energy uh, and people can get hurt. Uh, and so generally speaking, control design is a, is a multifaceted thing. Um, generally speaking here, um, you know, you, you, com you can combine controls, you can combine them in the same knob at different, you know, you, in different modes or in the same cluster if they do related things. And then on that thing like no knobs. So the other thing is what's called shape coding. And that's where um, um, you, you might have pictorial symbols uh, or, or uh, uh, so that when you quick look at something, there's a button, there's a lever, you can see that symbol. And that tells you that by the shape of that sy symbology, that image, um, what it is. It tells you what that... Uh, um, that what that control does as opposed to text um, or the sh or the shape of something you can you can um, understand what it does by feel so by just having your hand on a control board um, and you might not uh, need you, you ha might be looking with your eyes at whatever you're controlling and your hands on a knob well by holding by appropriate by um, f by feeling what that shape is and you feel that it's it's a knurled knob uh, that tells you that that's a rotary control and so that it by its shape in this case the shape you figure out tactily as opposed to visually um, that shape is communicating to you the nature of what its control is so that's called shape coding uh, and then generally speaking the placement of, of controls it should you, you, you want to factor in consistency uniformity um, the location based on frequency use. If you have some control knob, button, whatever um, that you almost never use, do you, re do you really want that next to the button you're constantly using? You know, so how do you, how do you, um, you know, spread things out? And oftentimes the things that are most frequently used are the ones, you know, right in the line of sight and the easiest to reach and those sorts of things. And then you obviously want to factor in, in, in to take into account safety. Okay, uh, and lastly, let's talk about just this human factors. Um, I've been talking about the, your car. I've talked a little about like your computer, but for the most part, I've been talking about your car in like a, you know, this various factory settings. Um, but let's talk about human factors in a couple other different fields, so like healthcare. Um, you think about healthcare. Uh, think about nurses and thinking about having to lift patients up and down. Thinking, thinking about. Um, you know, uh, uh, surgeons that are that are working with things like bone saws and all you know stuff that's actually can be quite um, can be quite physical. Uh, there's a uh, um, you know a real issue with uh, injuries uh, to, from healthcare workers um, in in their. Uh, there's also issues with you know injuries to patients if 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 uh, techniques aren't followed. Um, so there's a lot of human factors in the design of. Um, the workplace itself and the tools and medical devices and assist devices for the healthcare workers, medical devices that are going to be used on the patient, um, how you inter how the operator, so the, the healthcare worker, the, the doctor, the technician, the nurse, interfaces with, communicates bi-directionally the um, medical device and then how that medical device is then communicating uh, uh, um, acting upon um, or what have you, the patient itself, all of that um, has he, uh, human factors elements to it. Um, and obviously safety is a huge, huge part of all of that, both the safety of the healthcare worker and the safety of the patient and ease of use um, in trying to make it so that it, it, it's a uh, low training burden, um, 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 less mistakes, easier, easier training, uh, those sorts of things. And then we talked about um, um, the car, but there's other things to drive driving too that involves information. So there's GPS now, and so there's all sorts of mapping stuff. And then there's connectivity. Fancy term for that is called telematics. And then think about cruise control. And now you have things like adaptive cruise and all sorts of stuff, and varying levels of autonomy. Um, uh, you know, levels of uh, of uh, um, you know self-driving capability where now you can lane assist and then have things that'll change lanes you have things that'll now you know depending on your car that will stop at stop signs and all sorts of stuff and we're we're on our way anyway to full, to full self-driving and then there's lo there's lots of cars now that have some level of crash 
prevention. And all of those are, um, you know, d degrees of automation. They, they, they all involve um, communication. Um, in many cases, decision, decisions that are made by the, you know, that whole allocation of the person machine thing. You know, you know, if you have crash prevention, you want the operator to be able to take action to prevent a crash. But now we're having more and more where that allocation is also given to the, uh, um, to the, to the car itself, if it can detect, uh, and where, where it'll break itself in, in, in many circumstances. And then this is a fast moving, uh, area. And then obviously you've got computers, um, all sorts of elements of computers, uh, you know, the, the display, you, you might have a touch screen, you've got a phone and phone is it's a ridiculously complicated, uh, um, computer that has a, a touch screen in it that has, um, that has uh, connectivity to it, that has storage. Um, <laughs> your phone probably has an incredibly sophisticated camera system and recording system. Um, you got haptics on your phone, typically vibration. I mean, um, you've, uh, you've got a whole hell of a lot going on, uh, uh, in your pocket, um, yeah, or, or, or in your hand. And we're not even talking about your laptop. In many ways, your phone is, 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 uh, arguably much more sophisticated than your laptop. And, uh, you know, and, and, in some cases, as, uh, as, uh, as, depending on what you mean by it, uh, can often have more computing power or, or, or certainly more function in terms of what you expect of it. You might have, um, you might have just like Microsoft Office or Google Docs that you get through the cloud on your laptop and otherwise you don't use your laptop for much, but your phone, you know, you might have, depending on what generation you are, you might have 50 or, or, or even more apps that you regularly use and all sorts of other functions. Um, Anyway, um, and then you've got keyboards and, and mice and all, all sorts of ways that you're interacting, interacting with it. And, and there's, there's a thing called UX, user experience, and that's usually a software term, which is, um, you know, the icons and the display menus and the different screens and that sort of thing. Um, there's a great deal of uh, human factors that goes into software design. Okay, that is the end of our lecture. Um, and to recap what we talked about with engineering psychology, um, we talked about uh, what it was, um, a little bit of the, a little bit of the, the history, um, how it's about efficiency, and that, that might be efficiency of time, to, might involve tools, might have movement, might involve cost, um, and then of course it's a safety element too. And we talked a lot about this whole person machine system, um, and, and and what that meant in terms of which way the communication was going. And we talked about how that was displays, which would be various ways in which the machine is communicating to the person and then controls how the person is communicating to the machine. And finally, we talked about, uh, gave a couple examples with healthcare and, and with driving and with computers of, uh, of how this applies to other fields. And, and we just scratched the surface. And really by now, it should be clear that if it involves a human and it involves technology, and some level of interaction, some level of allocation of labor, so to speak, for a task, um, uh, that is an opportunity for engineering psychology to, to te those techniques and tools of engineering psychology to be applied, uh, uh, for the, for the purposes of effic efficiency, um, or safety. Okay. Um, next lecture is a bonus lecture, um, about, uh, it's an interview like the previous two, uh, but instead of interviewing somebody from HR, we're interviewing some, somebody who's in charge of corporate communications. So we're going to talk about how communication relates to um, psychology at work. And we're also going to talk a little bit about organizational culture and how that relates. And hopefully that's uh, uh, interesting to you. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll see you for the next lecture.